Welcome to The Art of Discernment, a podcast where professors from across the Master's University discuss current events and higher education from a biblical worldview. Hello and welcome to The Art of Discernment. This is Dr. Bob Dixon, and joining me today is Dr. Ross Anderson, a professor of biochemistry here at the Master's University for, if I'm getting this right, Dr. Anderson, this will be your 24th year. Here. Correct. Correct. Uh-huh. Dr. Anderson has a BA from Austin College, an MBS from the University of Colorado at Boulder, and a PhD from Baylor College of Medicine. Is that, I'm getting all that right. Baylor College of Medicine, Houston, Texas, yeah. Okay, Houston, Texas. Not to all be right. confused with Baylor University in Waco. Got it. Okay. And you are or were a postdoctoral researcher at the Molecular Genetics Division at the Houston Neurosensory Center, mm-hmm. and you have also taught at Baylor College of Medicine, and at Lamar University in Beaumont, Texas. So a lot of Texas in there, but you've been in California a long time now. It's really interesting because I've lived in California longer than any place else, though I still consider Texas home. Interesting. And uh, not partly that's where all my family is. That's where I pretty much grew up. So That makes sense. I, I, I don't think I've ever met anybody from Texas who isn't always calling Texas home. That's true. <laughs> if you do, then they're not truly Texas. <laughs> oh, there you go. Shots fired. I love it. All right. So today we're going to talk about something that I really have been looking forward to because I know this story and it's just a great story and I'm really excited to share it with our listeners. And it's the story of your journey from being an evolutionist to becoming a creationist. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and we want to get your perspective out of that uh, on how Christians can engage in this conversation with people who in their lives who maybe don't believe what they believe about how the world came to be they right. you know and and it's a it's a conversation that as as Christians we tend to avoid you know we want yeah. to avoid some, and and, yeah. and yet it's impossible to avoid so i th- i think the first thing our listeners probably want to know is how did you go from being an evolutionist to being a creationist well i'll give you a, a shortened version okay okay mainly through prayer all my formal education had been evolution, 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 both from, from high school through. And uh, it wasn't until after I got my PhD when I went to Lamar University. It's a state university. I looked at that as an opportunity. I considered myself to be a Christian. Uh, at the time, however, I wasn't as strong a Christian as I thought I was. And uh, students would come to me asking questions like, okay, you're, here you are teaching science, and, and everything there is evolution, evolution, evolution. But you're a Christian. How do you rectify that? And I'd really never given it that much thought until then. I was realized, okay, I'm in a t- position of teaching now. I, I'm on the other side of the desk. Mm. I need to know the, tr- the truth of this. I need to now nail this down once and for all for my own sake, if not for theirs. So I asked God, I said, what is the truth here? You know, you know, I've been taught all evolution, evolution, evolution. But Back in the back of my mind, I just didn't feel comfortable with that. I just didn't, but I didn't know how to defend that and how to refute what I had been taught. And that little prayer came at a stop sign or a stoplight one day on the way home from work or back to my little apartment from work. About two weeks later, God answered that question by introducing me to a little lady, little old lady, who flat out asked me, Have you ever read a book called Evolution of Theory and Crisis by Michael Denton? I said, no, this was at a, a church that I didn't normally attend. Some friends of mine had asked me to come to this other church, and I said, why not? And they introduced me to her, and that's the question she popped. And I said, well, she said, would you like to read it? I said, yeah. Well, as soon as my husband's finished with it, I'll let you read it. Well, I read it, I got it and read it. Um, that really opened my eyes, because this guy is an MD, PhD. He's talking my language, if you will. And he was presenting... All, all of that I knew, but in a whole different light. Now, he's not a Christian, but he's a, he's might be called an intelligent design person. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he brought up things that I know about, but we hadn't really been taught. I've never been taught. I mean, I thought, I, but I know he's right. You, you know how the, mm. the truth will resonate with you right. when you hear it. And that put me on fire. And I thought, good, there's somebody else in the world that's sort of questioning like I am. And then I read uh, Michael Behe's Black Box and uh, the same thing, same kind of thing. Or Darwin's black box. And uh, the day that I asked that little prayer about God, what is the truth? That's the day that God smiled. Because hmm. he's saying, now you're where I want you. You're asking the right questions. And I would tell anybody, regardless whether it's evolution you're dealing with, evolution creation, or any other aspect of your life, go to God and ask him point blank, what is the truth with this, with this issue? That's what he wants everybody to do. Come to him and ask that question because he loved to answer it. 
And he answered it very clearly for me. Well, it created waves and created problems there at the, at the state university. They, oh, yeah, they, I'm they sure. didn't like that. But like I say, God, God was preparing me all this time for working here at the Masters. God was preparing this position here at the Masters at the same time. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to listeners who engage with the world in, in this area? How, how would a Christian who obviously is a creationist, what advice would you give them to the right way to engage someone who believes in evolution? Several things, actually. One, read your Bible. Stay close to God because he's the one that's going to give you the wisdom, the insight, and the boldness to confront when the time comes. The other thing is learn as much as you possibly can about your, your discipline, whatever it is. In graduate school, let's say medical school, graduate school, they put a premium on intellect. And you, in order to win them over, even be, think about winning them over uh, theologically or th with Christ and stuff, you've got to build respect with them. And the only way you can really do that with them is be smart. Mm -hmm. Know your stuff, because that's what they look at. If you know your stuff, then they're more likely to listen to you when you talk about stuff that's not really related directly to what you're to the, to the science in this case. So prepare yourself, and 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 for undergraduates, I say to my students, I said this is the time you prepare yourself. God has given you a wonderful opportunity to learn how to prepare yourself for what's coming, and this is because my experience in the secular university and in the medical school, I'm able to tell them, okay, here's what you can expect, and here's how you can prepare. Whether you avail yourself of the blessings that God has given you here or not, well, that's up to you. But I would strongly encourage you, since you're paying this much money, to, right. to learn as what you can. So what would you say to, to someone who says, well, I'm a scientist, so you know, clearly I believe in evolution. Mm -hmm. Creation, that's, that's in the realm of religion. Right. Yeah, and that's where they try to put it. That's the other thing is you try to learn as much about where the other side, where they're putting their eggs, so to speak, where mm -hmm. they're, they're putting their, their trust. So you have to know both sides of the argument, not just one side. This is one of the things you find out with the evolutionists. They only really know one side. That's their side. And they don't know it that well. They only know what they've been taught and told to say. Right. Uh, but as a creationist, as a Christian, you have the extra responsibility before God uh, if you're going to defend his word and defend your faith, you've got to know both sides. You have to know more and be able to defend that. That's a command in, in the Bible, too, to, to defend and contend, fight for mm -hmm. what you believe there. And it means doing a little more homework than the other guy, so to speak. So you can see where they're coming from and be ready with a, a ready answer. You know, why... why uh, your viewpoint is the more correct viewpoint, the one that makes more sense in light of what we do know mm -hmm. rather than what we don't know. Uh, so you have to, again, if they look at you and say, you, you claim to be a scientist, then they're going to test you on that. You know? right. uh, and if, they, if you don't come across as really knowing that much in the way of science, then they're not going to trust you with anything else. I remember uh, my conversion you know, prior to it, my, the, the, the person of the Lord used to to bring the truth into my life mm -hmm. she and i argued that very thing she and uh, argued creation evolution and you know I, her her attitude toward me was you know not i'm not trying to win an argument with you right. you know th right. this is you know i'm and i didn't really even understand what that meant at the time i know now looking back she, it was, she was more interested in my soul than, than, right. than right. winning an argument but right. when the lord opened my eyes when I when mm -hmm. I when I became a Christian. That was the first thing I, I knew I had to understand. I said, okay, well, uh, evolution can't be true because Genesis reveals something else. And and if I'm gonna if if this if this Christianity thing is real, then I have to take the Bible at its word. So mm -hmm. this is what it says. So let me find out why I'm wrong. I I don't right. I don't right. know the and I was surprised to find out how much science there really was in support of, of right. You know, what, what the secular world calls intelligent design, right. what we call creation, there's, so there's, a, there, there's plenty of science behind the, and I'm the doing very, air quotes, religion of creation. It's, right, it's science. Right, exactly. Well, the key there was two things. One, the Holy Spirit had put it into you to seek the truth. Okay, at some point you realize, okay, I, I want to find out the truth behind this. Two, this, this young lady you were talking about, she recognized it's a heart issue. It's not really science versus science or religion versus, it's more religion or worldview versus worldview, mm -hmm. which science can play a role, but not a dominant role. 
And so she was trying to uh, not so much convince you via the science, but get you to recognize, okay, look at look for the truth. Seek out the truth. Because she knew if you got to that point and sought out the truth, then the Holy Spirit would lead you to the truth. And he did. Yes, he did. And, but there's a lot of people out there really not out after the truth. They think they already have it. And you've got to be able to recognize, use exercise discernment. Is the person I'm talking to really seeking after truth? Mm. Well, they just want to argue. If they want to argue, that's up to you. But uh, your time is better spent with somebody who's really asking earnest and sincere questions. That's a great point. So speaking of, of argument, mm. wh- what are some of the arguments or talking points that y- you often – uh, contend with as, when you're when you're having this conversation with an evolutionist. Well, the one thing they they build a whole lot on their whole uh, argument is built on the age of the Earth. The Earth is X number of billions of years old, so they think they've got enough time for evolution, all sorts of evolution to take place. So that's one pillar, if you will, holding up that their their argument. And this is why so much attention in the creationist community is focused on putting cracks or chinks in that in that particular pillar. In time, it, it will fall, and it's starting to fall. People in that, in that field recognize that, okay, we have sort of painted ourselves in a, into a corner. We say the Earth is, what, 4.5 billion years old, and the more decimal points they put on, that makes it sound like it's more exact and more accurate. Okay. And, uh, and that's the impression that people, oh, wow, you got to the 100th decimal, decimal yeah. point. Wow, you must know what you're talking about. It's 4.6, not 4.4. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, so... Again, they've begun to realize, as the more we learn about life, they begin to realize, as this Michael Denton did, uh, begin to realize that there's just not enough time. That, that things are way too much more, too much, too complex than we, what we thought 20, 30, 50 years ago. Mm-hmm. And um, so what are we going to do? <laughs> right. So you come up with, a lot of people come up with all these other ideas. They still want to hold on to evolution, but they, they tweak it here and tweak it there. Uh, well, evolution happened uh, too fast now. That's why you don't see the evidence of it in the rock layers. Okay. Well, uh, maybe there's life out there somewhere that's seeded. Right. This is the panspermia idea that, that, that uh, Francis Crick, uh, the, one of the co-discoverers of the structure of DNA, he kept to the point in his life uh, where he recognized that uh, with as much as we know now about life, no honest person would believe that evolution occurred here on Earth. Hmm. Okay, okay, here on Earth. <laughs> and so he posited it's coming out there. And then there's others that say, no, we have no evidence really that, of, of a life out there. Maybe we're just one of many universes that just happened to the okay. roll of the dice right. So hearkening back to an earlier question, th- that sounds more like religion to me. It than, is. Than, it really is. Than Mass Christianity does in, in, in this context. Well, see, that's the thing. If you get a scientist or even a group of scientists to say pretty much the same thing, then people in the general public who don't know that know science very much think, well, these guys must know what they're talking about. They're not – right. You know, as, as cookies as it might sound, uh, they're all on the same page, or uh, many of them are. And we look up to these scientists, and mm-hmm. we respect them, and we think they're smart, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And they take advantage of that. And they'd be able to spout foolishness, get away with and it. They, and they peer review, so but it's really – Yeah. They're, they're well, the peer each other review on the process, The peer review process is under a lot of uh, fire now, too, because too much uh, – if I don't like uh, – what you're saying, or if your what your research is is too close to mine, and you're you're wanting to publish something that I'm just on the verge of publishing, I will say no, nope, no, nope, can't 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 uh, publish that. <laughs> yeah, that makes it so. So it, mm-hmm. if you're in a discussion with with someone and having this, I'll call it having this argument, right? You're you're having this this debate with a, an evolutionist. How how would you strategically speaking, you know, how do you refute those, you know, the age of the earth, for example? How, just, well, and I, I know we don't have forever, and this yeah, is this is this is, this is a semester's well, worth of information I'm well, asking the, for. The biggest, the biggest, I'll say, arrow in the quiver that they use for pushing the age of the earth is radiometric dating. Okay, that seems to be somewhat unassailable, and they they. Uh, present it as though it's unassailable. I mean, everybody agrees. You can't argue with these these facts and stuff. But what and what I would try to do is get people to recognize. Okay, the, all these different dating methods. One, they give you very different dates when you expect them to. If they're that accurate, they all should land on pretty much on the same same dates. They don't. Uh, but more importantly, is the under underlying all of them are certain 
sets of assumptions that are made. And it's already been shown that none of those assumptions are really valid, but they're unstated because most people recognize, well, wait a minute, that's, you're just assuming, mm. and that's not true. You're assuming that, that's not true. And you're assuming that, that's not true. So they go unstated. But the people in the field, of course, know those assumptions, but they're not going to come out publicly and undermine their what they're trying to push. So I would get, talk to someone and say, okay, let's look at some of the assumptions that are made. Uh, and those assumptions, okay. what do you mean assumptions? Yeah. And as soon as they realize these assumptions, they'll realize, oh, yeah, so much of these these cards are um, – so much of this interpretation of the data is built on a house of cards. Right. And uh, and then suddenly it takes on a whole new uh, – They took in a whole new look at it and began to realize it's not unassailable like they thought. You mentioned the that there are assumptions that undergird the radiometric dating. I'm just a layperson, but I'm curious. Can you? Is there any way to kind of summarize that in a way that I could understand? Yeah. So when when they want a radiometric date, uh, a rock or something, well, they'll just go to the rocks and 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 find a rock or something like that, like a piece of granite or something like that. And what they'll do is take samples of that rock, you know, little crystals and whatnot, different parts of the same rock, or, and they'll send them to these various labs that are specialized in radiometric dating. And there's a whole host of different methods. Now, one of the assumptions is, is that, okay, they're looking for what they call a parent compound and a daughter compound. The parent compound over a certain amount of time turns into the daughter compound. Now, since nobody was there when the rock was initially formed, what we call the initial conditions, certain assumptions have to be made about those initial conditions. Any parent and, and or daughter found in the rock were there from the beginning. And it has le- and then the other assumption is that it's been left pretty much undisturbed all these millions or billions of years. Okay. Uh, in other words, no, no daughter compound has leaked out or leached in. Likewise with the parent. Well, these are basic assumptions. And one of the other assumptions is that the rate at which the parent turns into the daughter, which is called the half-life, basically, has been constant. And for many uh, years, decades, it's thought that really nothing can change that. That's a, like a physical constant time type thing for each each uh, daughter parent-daughter uh, pair. But recent evidence suggests that no things, environmental fact, various environment can in fact change. These. Sometimes speed them up tremendously millions of fold faster. So now you have to come back and revisit that. We know that, going back to the other assumption, we know that uh, radioactive material leaks in and leaks out of rocks and sediments and stuff like that. We, we try to, when we bury radioactive waste, we try to take precautions to prevent that. But that flies in the face of that one assumption mm. that, that they don't <laughs> leak in and out. And again, the other initial assumptions that uh, you know the initial amounts of the daughter, parent daughter, that's just all an assumption. But anyway, based on those assumptions, those basically those big three, you then go do your studies and stuff, your measurements. Now, when those same, when we've done the same kind of measurements, using the same techniques from the same labs on different rocks that we know the date of, we know these were formed within our man's lifetime. We observed it. We get dates in the millions of years when, it, when we know it may be only 200 years be. old. 200 years old, and they come out millions of years. You do another test, still millions of years. We know these, the, the method and the assumptions don't really work with da- rocks of known age, but we're expected to buy into the dates, huh. et cetera, re- reported of rocks of unknown age. Come on. What sane person would say, yeah, okay, I'll do that? The question has to be asked, why bother? Like, wh- why go through all this trouble? Why is it so important for someone listening to this podcast, you know, maybe even a Christian, to have the truth about the origins of the universe? And, and for a Christian who's maybe, say it's a college-age student, they're a Christian, they've been raised in a Christian home, they're, they're at a secular school, they're not a scientist, they don't, they don't want to fight this fight, and they figure, well, what difference does it make? I'm here, you know, why does it matter? That's sort of the mindset I had way back when. I'm saying, you know, hey, what, what difference does it make how we got here? We're here. Let's Take it out from here, and how do we live today and in, in, in the, our lives today? Because uh, we can't go back in time and un- change things or manipulate things. So, But then God said, wait a minute, hold on, Newt. It does matter. And the more I read the Bible, uh, starting in Genesis, and more I read Genesis, I began to realize, no, this. if you discount Genesis, particularly the first 11 chapters, 
We're talking about creation and the flood. And I look at other Christians who have discounted that stuff, and I see the slippery slope that they are on. They now begin to question the miracles in the New Testament. They begin, one of those being the resurrection, the virgin birth, because science clearly says that ain't going to happen. So where do you draw the line? And I began to realize this does impact how you view the Word of God. If you really believe this is the Word of God, and God cannot lie, then this is true in, in Genesis. And That's going to impact how you interpret the whole rest of the Bible. The whole of Christendom is built on that foundation in Genesis, laid down in Genesis. And we all know from everyday experience when the foundation of a house or a building begins to crack or begins to, when you come pour that foundation, you don't pay attention to ah, the details. It's in time that whole edifice built on top of it will fall. It's just a matter of time. And so I, this is why I try to stress to, to young students, and all Christians really, read Genesis. Think about what you're reading. There's plenty of DVDs, books, magazines, whatever, of, uh, information available to support, to give you the scientific background, if you're really interested in that, to, to, that supports that. And you can't, if, if you allow the Holy Spirit to guide your, your thinking and your reading, you will come away with a newfound respect for the Word of God, that you'll carry it all the way through, and it'll manifest itself in the other parts of your life. I just can't overemphasize the importance of, of all that. and That's what I found personally, and I've seen it in other people's lives, too. I, I love that you, that you mentioned the resurrection, the virgin birth, because— you know, we don't want anybody listening to this podcast to think that, you know, that it's that God's got to prove Himself to us. You know, that right. that, that the Bible somehow we we have to defend the Bible as scientifically true. There, right. there, right. God, God is God, and there yeah. and there are things in in Scripture that that can't be scientifically explained because they're That's miracles, they're, miracles. they're yeah. acts of God, so, yeah. and and, yeah. and Christianity is an act of faith. It is a thinking it is. faith. It is. It's not a blind faith, it, as, as many would say. Right. Would think it is a faith. I always think well. Even even with creation or evolution, where science is involved, and I have said there there, there is plenty of science to support creation. Right. Uh, it is it is a debate. The burden of proof is does it not fall on the person of faith? Right. Because the person of faith is a person of faith. The burden of proof ought to fall on the on the scientist. They're making well. Both groups are making a claim. Okay. okay. So, but what what Christians need to realize is the other side. I'll say. All theirs is based on faith also, the faith <laughs> there that there is not a God, or if there is a God, he's not actively involved, and the, that's their faith. So you begin to realize it's a battle of worldviews, not science versus mm. science or our science versus their science, because we're looking at the same data, and it's just a matter of how do you interpret that data based on your the, the lens of uh, the Bible, the mm-hmm. Word of God, or the lens of man, which we all know, and every, even they will admit, man is very fallible. And so, but you want to put your faith in what man says, which is does change all the time, but the word of God doesn't change. I mean, it was, it was written thousands over thousands of years, right. thousands of years ago, and you read it today, and it's still directly applicable today. But the science we read just fifty years ago isn't applicable today. A lot of it, right? A lot of it is, but a lot of it isn't. So, where are you going to put your faith? A firm foundation or weak and shifting sand? Dr. Anderson, this has been this has been really fun. Uh, I I was an English major. I was not a science major, but we live it. We live in a physical, tangible world yeah, that, we do. and the science is very uh, is fascinating to me. And mm-hmm. and I love having these conversations with you. And I'm I'm sure your students. I'm sure you have these conversations in class all the time. Oh yeah, in the origins class. Yeah. Well, in all my classes, I I. Yeah. <laughs> The design that's evident when you study life on the molecular, the atomic level, you, yeah. it just jumps out at you. It, it shouts, as Michael Behe, another biochemist who wrote Darwin's Black Box back in the 95 or 96, he said, it design shouts. And, and he's right. He's right that you'd have to be willfully ignorant to say it doesn't or to ignore it. And that's the other thing. Many, the more we learn, Many of the creation, many uh, of the evolutionary community are recognizing. Yeah, it's it's designed. It sure looks like it's designed. Mm-hmm. Even even Dawkins said, "Sure looks like it's designed." <laughs> but then he turned right around real quick and says, yeah. "But that's an illusion." Uh, and I think talk so, about willfully ignorant. So, so, the, so the truth of the matter is that people want to say you got science on one extreme and you have 
Christianity on the other extreme as if they're opposite ends of the pole. Oh, but no. the reality is yeah. that science, looking at looking at the world, even scientifically, is going to lead you to glorify the Lord because his artistry, his design is so you, evident. Well, Romans chapter one says you're without excuse. And you look at, if you look at a little bit of the history of science, some of the big names that everybody's taught in chemistry and physics, et cetera, were themselves creationists, or they believe Bible-believing, Bible-reading Christian people that I feel like God had, through the Holy Spirit, had given them certain insights and in, uh, in whatever discipline it was, and pushed science and pushed to the point where then now we come along and we stand on their shoulders, as other people have put it. But see, a lot of that's downplayed in the public schools and stuff, mm. that, that the, the earliest scientists, they're just basically like they didn't really exist. Oh, an occasional mention of the name, Isaac Newton. Oh, everybody. <laughs> Who's that? But, but they look <laughs> at his scientific and mathematical uh, oh, accomplishments, but they, won't under, they will never broach the, the reason Newton and some of these others studied and did, because they believed in God. Newton wrote more on theology than science, Wow. but people are not aware of that. If a lot of people were younger people were aware of that, and if they were taught that, they might have one new uh, begin to realize, hey, you can be a good qualified scientist and believe in God's word. Ross, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for listening to The Art of Discernment. For more information on the Masters University, visit masters.edu. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We'll see you next time.